Let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you're using the church Bibles, that'll be page 651. I'll give you just a moment to turn there. First Corinthians chapter 12. To start today's message, I wanted to invite you into some of my world as a preacher in the local church. Uh, I believe if you were to talk to other preachers, they would certainly tell you the same thing that I'm about to tell you. But um, I preached a lot over the years, uh, mostly at South Bay, uh, but not only at South Bay. And I was talking with Dave, our guest worship leader, didn't he do so great? Um, and I was talking with him over the weekend. I, I told him that I, I love to have fun and, and try to fill life with uh, lots of joy and, and laughter. But when it comes to preaching, there's really nothing I take more seriously. I have many passions in this life. Many of you know I'm a musician. You know I love to cook. But, but I, I only have one very high calling, which is to preach the word of God. And, and that's why I don't come up here to share my opinions or my persuasions on different subjects. Um, I come to deliver the scriptures to you. That's my job um, as in, in a one-sentence job description. <laughs> Um, but that said, I, I think about it often how some messages um, really come together so easy. And, and some messages demand a decent amount of work. Sometimes I sit down at my desk and I, I open up the scriptures to the text for that particular weekend. And the message is just so clear, so evident. And usually that's because it's something that's been deeply resonating with me for a few weeks or maybe even a few months. Uh, last week's message was certainly one of those messages. Occasionally, uh, preachers will really wrestle and struggle through producing a message that clicks. But when I do have a week where the Spirit develops a message from His Word um, so easily such as last week's message, the hardest temptation that I face is trying to fit everything about the selected text or topic into one message. I find that I struggle with this often, uh, wanting to cover everything within and indirectly or directly related to the current subject. And sometimes I have so much that I feel like I'd like to say on the matter, but we don't necessarily have the time or the attention to receive it, and, and that's okay. I quickly learned that the best preachers don't have to say everything in one message. I've heard some preachers like that over the years who squeezed everything that they needed to say in, but at the end, it was like drinking from a fire hydrant and you had no idea what the main point of the text actually was. And that's not my goal on Sunday morning. When I preach, I want you to read the text thoroughly, to know the text intimately, and to apply the text accurately for the rest of the week. Uh, all of that considered, today's message is uh, quite literally a continuation of last week's message. So if you missed last week's message, um, that's very important that you go back and watch that because that will really um, be the base point for where we're going today. Um, and we, we know that's true of every series in a sense, but this message is, is literally intended to pick up last week's message from where it ended. So just consider this a, a part two. Um, two weeks ago, we started a brand new series uh, called Equipped, Finding Your Place in the Story of God. And we read through and studied Psalm 90, a psalm of Moses, and concluded that you and me are not the reference point or the end goal of our own lives. We have something, or, or might I say, someone much greater than us to live for. And that is God and his greater story. And the good news is that you have been invited to carry out God's purpose with your life. And then last week, we picked that up with Ephesians 4. God has a wonderful purpose, not only for the world, but for the local church. And it involves you. 
God uses the local church for your sanctification. We said sanctification was just a, a big fancy Bible word for um, your growth in Christ's likeness that you become like Christ. And so God uses the local church for your sanctification and growth in Christ's likeness. And then God uses your growth in the church to strengthen your witness in the world. And more on that next week. But as far as what we determined from the text last week, it was simply that your sanctification is, is somewhat um, like those team projects that you hated in grade school. Uh, that's right, your sanctification is a group effort. God does the work through the people in the seats that are surrounding you, the local family of blood-bought, spirit-filled believers in the church. And in the text, Paul urged the church toward unity, ministry, and ultimately maturity. Somewhere near the middle of the text last week, we recognize that no matter our education, no matter our testimony or our experience in the Christian faith, each one of us has a ministry. Come on, say it with me. I have a ministry. I have a ministry. Say it one more time. I have a ministry. Let's do it one more time, but this time I wanted you to take your thumb and I want you to point it back at me. I have a ministry. When Paul wrote it, he meant it. When I preached it, I meant it. When you said it, did you mean it? Did you believe it? That despite your past, despite your education or lack thereof, or despite your study or, or depth of understanding and everything pertaining to scripture, that you have a ministry? Could you believe it? And even if you did believe it, would you know what your ministry is? That's the question I want you to wrestle with today as we continue through the scripture. To wrap up the message last week, the, the setup for where we'll be going today, um, we summarized the text with Paul's own words from Ephesians 4, verse 15 to 16. This is what Paul said. Rather, speaking the truth in love... We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Anybody remember this? In these particular statements, Paul is essentially repeating what he already said before in the text. However, there's one phrase from within that we can be tempted to read over. That we miss it. <laughs> and that is exactly why it's italicized on the screen. The phrase is, when each part is working properly. That phrase, and specifically the concept behind that phrase, is what I, as your pastor, have been sitting on for about six months now. When Paul describes uh, each part, as we read on the screen, what do you think he's talking about? He's talking about the people in the church. He's talking about you, <laughs> And he echoes this idea further in today's text. But for now, let me just ask you a question. And I don't want you to answer this question. Uh, not out loud, anyway. Uh, in fact, I, I want you to take a moment for reflection. Uh, I'm going to take a short pause after I put this question out in the air. Um, perhaps you could even, if you wanted to, close your eyes as to get a clear picture. Here's the question. Imagine with me. Um, what could become of our local church if each part is working properly.
Imagine the life and vitality that you'd find across our church. Imagine what the weekend services would be like. Imagine uh, the testimonies of God's faithfulness that you'd hear in community group each and every week. Imagine how God would work in and through us as a church and, and, and you get to see it. And not only do you get to see it, but you also get to be involved in all of the fun. And you'd never want to miss out on anything in the church. Your faith would increase your expectation for God to move would be heightened. You would grow in knowledge and maturity and, and love because of how God is working through the community of brothers and sisters. And church gatherings of any kind and of any size would be the most exciting place to be. And so that leads us to the question, how do we know if each part is working properly in our church? What's the sign or proof that this is, in fact, the case for us? What does a fully functioning church look and feel like? Here's how I would answer that question. Fully functioning churches are churches that have each member serving one another through their spirit-empowered, gift-based ministry. Let's break that down just a little bit. So fully functioning churches, that's our first part of the statement here, um, are vibrant, alive church families that are pursuing the kingdom of God and bearing the fruit of collective ministry. Fun fully functioning churches are churches that have each member. Now, each member doesn't have to mean formal membership, although you know we highly promote that in our church. Um, this is concerning, though, every believer, because once you become a believer and choose to follow Jesus, you are considered an informal member of the body of Christ, which is the church. And each member is serving one another. You may not know this, you may know this. Um, there are roughly 70 one another instructions in the New Testament. Uh, love one another, greet one another, and build one another up. Um, there are many others that we could list. And we put these instructions into practice. We actually obey these commands through different forms of service. But not just any kind of service. It says, fully functioning churches are churches that have each member serving one another through their spirit-empowered, gift-based ministry. The Holy Spirit has been on the scene since the dawn of creation, but became fully present and accessible to believers at Pentecost. Now, since that day, um, when you begin to follow Jesus and you receive his eternal life, you are also given the Holy Spirit who remains within you. And that same Spirit who lives in you gives you the power and the ability to minister to one another through unique giftings, which we usually reference by a creative and very original name, I must say, uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That'll come to you later. It's okay. Sometimes I do like to spice it up and call them spiritual gifts. Um, but these spiritual gifts determine the means by which you would most effectively serve the larger body of Christ. And Peter addresses this in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 through 11. And he says, As each has received a gift... Use it to serve one another as uh, good stewards. Everybody say good stewards. good stewards. As good stewards of God's varied grace. Wh whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Uh, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The Apostle Peter says that each believer, that is every one of you who have believed, has received a gift. 
and must use it. And he correlates the various gifts with the manifold or varied grace of God. Now, remember from last week, grace is often understood as unmerited favor as it relates to the forgiveness of sin. But the New Testament goes much farther than that understanding of grace and teaches grace as an empowering quality of salvation, which is not only concerned with being saved from something, but being saved for or even to something. And so when you think of this idea of the manifold grace of God, think of a a pipe which splits off in many different directions as to supply every section of the house with whatever is in the pipe. Uh, This week, I needed to use the water hose outside the church, um, but it had been closed off for the winter as to prevent the pipes from freezing and bursting. And so when I went down into the basement to turn it back on, I very quickly realized that I had no idea which pipe actually connected to the water hose outside. I'm telling you, if you walk down there, there's about 500 pipes in there. Um, And there were one of two rather large pipes, and and there were many smaller pipes coming from those pipes which dispersed the water to the different areas of this building. Um, Thankfully, I had Tim Luce to come and assist me. Um, But the manifold or the varied grace of God is much the same. It's one larger pipeline of grace that feeds into many parts of the church through smaller pipelines of distinct gifts. Now, by using our gifts, we experience for ourselves the empowering, undeserved grace of God. And then we also demonstrate and extend that same grace to others, therefore stewarding the grace of God well. But Peter then mentions two specific types of gifts within the church, those of uh, speaking and, and those of serving. Now, there is no New Testament categorization of gifts, but if there was, this would probably be the closest biblical support that we could find. And he says that those who speak should do it carefully as though they were speaking on behalf of God. And for those who serve, let them do it not in their own power, but in the power of the one who gave them such gifts. And as everyone stewards God's grace by operating in their gifting, who gets the glory? God does. God is glorified in that. If you see someone using their gift to bring honor and attention, and glory to themselves. That's not of the Holy Spirit. In fact, it very well could be demonic. There are people who may um, practice outside of the church of what looks like spiritual gifting, but it's deceiving. There's a specific purpose for spiritual gifts as opposed to other similar practices. Um, Spiritual gifts are used for the glory of God alone and for the building up of other believers. That's why we have the gifts. Now, this idea is going to come up multiple times today and you're going to feel like someone's playing a broken record. Um, But here's the thing. Um, Last week, we simultaneously said, I have a ministry. But this week, we want to ask God, and our brothers and sisters, I might add, what that ministry is, and how our ministry can serve God's purpose in the church. Now, God's purpose for the church is his own glory and the growth of everyone in the local body. Some churches never talk about spiritual gifts and the unique ministries of each person in the body. And at that point, it's dependent on the pastor alone to do all the ministry work. But on the other hand, there are churches that emphasize gifting to the point of doing it for all the wrong reasons. It becomes an environment uh, that invites the use of spiritual gifts, but for the sake of their own attention or ego. And it ends up not honoring God or edifying the church at all. And we've seen both extremes, right? 
The church at Corinth was much like uh, the latter. Corinth was a, a pretty bad off church. Uh, they experienced a lot of division within the church over leadership. Uh, they had some crazy sex scandals in the church. And, and then they also needed some rebuke about idolatry in the church. But despite its many issues, the church at Corinth was God's, or was, sorry, was Paul's baby. Paul loved the believers at Corinth with a unique affection that surpassed his affection for the other churches. He wanted to see them thrive in the abundant life of God. But all of that considered, we know that one thing that the church at Corinth was not lacking was the utilization of spiritual gifts. They were, they were big on spiritual gifts. I mean, it was, it was a, a booming place for that reason. But the only problem was that the believers at Corinth needed some direction and, and clarity for how to use them properly and in a way that honors God and builds the church. And Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians 12 uh, through chapter 14. And today we'll spend most of our time in 1 Corinthians 12, but we'll, we'll borrow uh, a little from Paul's writings elsewhere concerning the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, so let's just read together 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul says in verse 1, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers... I do not want you to be uninformed. Jumping down to verse 4. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for what? The common good. Now, for to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, uh, to, to another the interpretation of tongues." All of these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one Spirit." For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body. I love that part. God arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greatest honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there, be, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. 
And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts. Paul begins, and he says, Now, uh, concerning the spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. It is believed by many Bible scholars that with all the issues within the church, the church had actually wrote a letter to Paul for guidance. And that is why the letter of 1 Corinthians, if you read through it, feels much like a, a question and response form. In that day, it actually would have been called a responsa. Now, responsas were writings given from the rabbis in, you guessed it, response to the questions of their students. And we see all throughout the letter, uh, now concerning this, now concerning that, now concerning this, now concerning that. Now in chapter 15, Paul even writes into the text some of their actual questions that they had wrote to him. That said, Paul is going to spend the next three large portions of his letter addressing the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And he says he does not want them to be uninformed, and, and neither would I as your pastor. Now this text provides for us a bit of a crash course on spiritual gifts and the part that they play in the ministry of a church. So continuing on, Paul says there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. Someone recently pointed out to me that this scripture could be an evidence that the entire Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, are involved in the gifts and the ministry of the church. The Spirit disperses the gifts among the believers. The Son, Jesus Christ, rules over the usage of the gifts as Lord. And the Father empowers beginners or believers um, to serve with their gifts in ministry. That's a really interesting reading of Paul's words here and could be trustworthy. However, I don't necessarily know if there's enough research into the original language to have a firm conviction on this. Um, Paul's greater point in this portion of the text is that um, though there is a large diversity of gifting within the body, there is unity in God. It's diversity in unity. And it's unity for diversity. And so Paul writes, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And to say it differently, um, your gift provides a vehicle for the Spirit to minister to the church. Uh, it is the Holy Spirit himself who is actually um, working in the body. Encouraging the other believers, serving them, convicting them, guiding them, forming them. Holy Spirit performs that ministry as each believer puts their gift into practice. But there's nothing special about your gift apart from the Spirit who gives it to you and works in it. This is why I believe that spiritual gifts must be understood apart from natural gifts and acquired gifts. First of all, I believe that spiritual gifts are given to you at the moment you choose to follow Jesus. You aren't born with spiritual gifts. Why? Because you aren't born with Holy Spirit. And it is Holy Spirit who places those gifts within you. So if you don't yet have Holy Spirit, <laughs> then you don't yet have his gifts either. Does that make sense? But to that same point, Natural gifts, or what we usually call talents, uh, may be God-given in the sense that God creates all of us, but they're not necessarily spiritual gifts. There are many unbelieving people who have excellent talent. 
Uh, Furthermore, acquired gifts, or what we might call skills, um, that you have learned over time in different settings, are not your spiritual gifts either. In other words, there is no spiritual gift of singing, and there is no spiritual gift of carpentry. Those are excellent talents and and skills that can be used for the work of the Lord, but they're also useful for secular work. (laughs) One final note on that. Spiritual gifts are not just your abilities. Let me just say this with caution. Um, I don't want to cause any confusion or concern. I want you to hear me. If you run the soundboard or hand out bulletins, or direct cars to park in the parking lot. Those are uh, helpful and and necessary things for our church gatherings. I'm so thankful for how you serve our church each weekend. But those are not in and of themselves your spiritual gifts. Your spiritual gifts go far beyond specific tasks. And they make an impact much greater (laughs) than a particular function at our church. Your gifts may give reason as to why you do those ministries, but your gift has far more reach than a specific job. Are you picking up what I'm laying down? And so returning to the text, the gifts of the Spirit are for the common good. Again, the believers at Corinth manipulated their gifts to push their own interests and ego ahead, but Paul says that the gifts aren't ultimately for you. They're not about you. They're for God's glory and the good of the larger body. And that's why the Spirit gives them to you. That's why the Spirit comes to minister through the gifts, to strengthen believers, to increase their faith, to cultivate unity. It's the common good. But Paul follows this up by giving a non-exhaustive list of the gifts of the Spirit. Um, There are other lists provided for us in Romans 12, verses 3 through 8, or 1 Peter 4, uh, uh, verses 8 through 11, and and as some understand, Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12, although I, I think I stated last week that I believe these to be offices and not necessarily gifts, per se. Um, Now, before we move on, I think it's important to give you our frame of reference as a church concerning the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, When it comes to forming a theology around spiritual gifts, there are two larger schools of thought that you should consider. Um, They are commonly known as cessationism and continuationism. Cessationism... And continuationism. I'm wondering if you can guess where this is going. Um, Cessationism believes in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but believes that some particular gifts, specifically what you might call the charismatic gifts, uh, ceased at the end of the apostolic age and the canonization of Scripture. In other words, when the final apostle died and the New Testament was finished, The gifts of tongues and prophecy and healing came to an end. This is usually based off of a misunderstanding of the purpose of these gifts and a misguided interpretation of a few different scriptures, um, especially, I would say, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. So let's just turn there. It should just be the next page. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 10. This is really important, guys. I want you to catch this. So, um, Paul says, Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. So cessationists have this idea that the perfect that Paul describes here in the, uh, in the, is the New Testament. That when the perfect comes, and or, or in other words, when the New Testament is finished, that these gifts will cease. That sounds fantastic, except there's one really big problem. Verse 12. <laughs> if you would look with me. For now, we see in a mirror dimly. But then, face to face, now I know in part, 
but then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Has anyone in this room seen God face to face? Does anyone know God fully, even as you have been fully known? (laughs) No. (laughs) No. That happens at the return of Jesus Christ. His return is the perfect. And at that point, there will be no need for tongues, no need for prophecy, no need for words of knowledge. They will then end. But continuationists believe, as you might assume, that all the gifts have continued (laughs) from the early church into today. We believe that all gifts are helpful and accessible today by all those that the Spirit gives those gifts to. Now, not all believers have these specific gifts, but only the Spirit, uh, but only as the Spirit chooses to give them. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to go into a detailed biblical theology of the charismatic gifts, but I I would suggest 1 Corinthians 14 if you want to know more about those gifts in particular. Um, But now that you have that information, I I think it's necessary to tell you that um, though you are welcome to disagree with me on this, our stance as a church on these issues is continuationism. I find it very difficult to convey any idea from Scripture that particular gifts have ceased with the apostles or with Scripture. You're welcome to chat with me about that at another time. But knowing that, let's discuss the various gifts of the Spirit. We're going to have to uh, fly through these. But that's where Paul goes next in the text, uh, beginning in verse 8 and continuing into verse 10. Some of these I'm more familiar with, some I'm not. Be patient as we go through all of them. Um, So there is first... The utterance or word of wisdom. So the utterance or word of wisdom is the ability to understand and discern God's will for the body based on what you know to be true about God's character and his word and to skillfully apply it to life situations with discernment. The utterance or word of knowledge is very similar to the word of wisdom. It's the ability to understand the deep things of God and the mysteries of his word. Then there is the gift of faith. These are the people you want on the prayer team. (laughs) They have this unshakable, uh, unique level of confidence in the power and promises of God. They're generally optimistic and sometimes rub those with the gift of prophecy the wrong way. And then there's the gifts of healing. Notice the text says gifts of healing. Um, I'm not studied enough to give confident answers on this, but at this time, here's what I would say. I would say that uh, those with gifts of healing have a distinct ability, um, a spirit-empowered ability to lay hands on a wounded or ill person and to see the spirit move through them to heal the person. That's pretty self-explanatory. Benny Hinn is not a good example of this. Uh, So then there is the working of miracles. Again, not my most well-read, but to borrow a definition from a very well-accredited website, gotquestions.org, it is the ability of, quote, performing supernatural events that could only be attributed to the power of God. I'll leave that one there. Uh, The gift of prophecy. Um, This is a gift I'm particularly fond of. I believe it to be one of my spiritual gifts. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, pursue love earnestly desire the gifts, especially that you may prophesy. I have always uh, described the spiritual gift of prophecy as the ability to receive uh, divine revelations for the believing community. We cannot resist prophecy, that's 1 Thessalonians 5, but we must test it and hold on to what is good. Prophecy is also not synonymous with teaching or the recalling of scripture. Paul makes a clear distinction between those two gifts. It can be a phrase, a statement, or even an image intended for the body as a whole or individual believers to comfort, to encourage, or or perhaps even to confront sin. And then there's the gift of the distinguishing of spirits, what we usually call discernment. Um, Discernment is the ability to separate right from wrong, good from evil, truth from error. And that's especially helpful in testing prophecy. 
I would also add that this gift in particular is best practiced with many who have the gift of discernment. This is a really great group gift, (laughs) a communal discernment, if you will. And then there's everybody's favorite, the gift of tongues, or in the interpretation of tongues. Now my understanding of scripture is that there are tongues which men can understand in Acts chapter 2, and tongues which only God can understand from 1 Corinthians 14. The former is the ability to speak French when you've never taken a French class, and it's especially useful for evangelism. But the latter is useful for public worship only, only, everybody say only, only only if there is also an interpretation and can be used as another method of delivering God's instruction or encouragement to the church. The interpretation of tongues is also a spiritual gift, just like every other spiritual gift. Now, um, one more from further below in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, um, is the gift of administration. Um, The Spirit of God has given certain believers a specific capacity for helping lead the ministry and the mission of the church through efficient organization and delegation. And what they do is they, they keep everything and everyone in order so that, in, uh, so that other ministers in the church are distraction free for what is most important to their ministries. But now I want to just continue with uh, the other gifts that are listed in Romans 12. So there's the gift of helps or service. Um, these are the believers who the Spirit uses most effectively in the background. They're the ones who put in the hard work for helping the church achieve its mission. And they usually jump in before you even ask. And they love to help without getting the credit for it. These ministers help all kinds of people with all kinds of tasks. Big and small. Major and trivial. And then there's the gift of teaching. Teaching is the ability to understand and clearly communicate God's word to other believers. To rightly divide the scriptures, uh, to apply it accurately so that they may be equipped for every good work. But this gift is one of, um, sorry, I lost my place. This gift is one that all of us should not desire. That's what James 3.1 says, right? Not all of us should seek to be teachers. Because the moment that we become a teacher, we have a higher calling and higher expectations. And then there's the gift of exhortation. This gift is the gift of encouragement. The Spirit gives certain believers uh, the heightened ability to speak in a way uh, such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may extend grace to those who hear. And they do well to admonish the idle and to encourage the faint-hearted. And as they encourage others, they themselves are encouraged. Exhortation um, is not just the ability to compliment. It's not to say, hey, You've got a nice dress on today, lady. It's, it's, it's encouragement that moves someone to action, that, that spurs someone towards love and good deeds, that, um, it, that moves them into perseverance or initiation of a ministry opportunity. And then there's the gifts of contribution or generosity. Some will never be front and center, and some will never even play a role in the background. Some feel a a special prompting and empowerment to support the ministry and the mission of the church through abundant generosity. They don't work the mission, but they fund it. They joyfully share what they have with others, um, whether it is financial or material or the giving of personal time and attention. The giver is concerned for the needs of others and seeks opportunities to share goods and money and time with them as needs arise. Then there's the gift of leadership and service. The word literally means guide and carries with it the idea of one who steers a ship to shore. It's the ability to counsel wisely and to disciple a person or a group of persons into spiritual maturity and obedience. And then finally, everyone take a deep breath. (sighs) Finally, there is the gift of mercy. The gift of mercy is obvious in those who are compassionate toward others, who are in distress, showing sympathy and sensitivity, uh, coupled with a desire and the resources to lessen their suffering in a kind and cheerful manner. 
Now, why did I just go through every spiritual gift described in Scripture? Pastor Matt, don't you see what time it is? Uh, Here's why. Here's why. Every person who has received God's abundant life has at least one of these gifts. None of you have all of these gifts. That's what we see at the end of 1 Corinthians 12. And there's a reason for that. Because you might ignore the community if you do that. But according to 1 Corinthians 12, 11, all these gifts are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. None of these are more important or more spiritual than the others. No specific gift proves your salvation. You do not not have certain gifts because of any sins you've committed or because of your intelligence or experience in the faith. You have the gifts you have because the Spirit gave them to you. You don't have the gifts you don't have because the Spirit did not give them to you. But what I do know is that you have a distinct gift of the Spirit that He has placed within you. And I need you to use it. And the person beside you needs you to use it. And the person in front and behind you needs you to use your gift. Whatever gift it may be. So to conclude, Paul brings us to the last half of the chapter 12. I'm not going to go through it. There's this illustration of the body and how we're all individual members of it. And this is an illustration that Paul uses often. In fact, it's where we began today's message in Ephesians 4. Um, But this portion of the text teaches us three very important things. Don't miss this. We must not elevate any particular gifts above the rest. We cannot resist any specific gifts within the body. And we should not neglect the use of our own spiritual gift. Do we commend or favor certain gifts in our church? Are we refusing to make space for certain gifts to be practiced in our church? Is the church being robbed of anything because you're hesitant to faithfully use your gift? All of these present an opportunity for stagnancy in our church and puts us at a disadvantage, especially the last one. Brothers and sisters, God never made a spirit-filled spectator. If you're a follower of Jesus, then Holy Spirit lives in you. And if Holy Spirit lives in you, then his plan is to use you. And so long as you resist that, you will never truly live. You will only exist, and there's no joy in that. Ask the Spirit to make your calling and your gifting evident. And when he's revealed to you the way in which he wants to use you, come to church and be used. (laughs) That doesn't sell. (laughs) But that's how we experience and extend the manifold grace of God. Come and be used. Why? For the glory of God and the good of his holy church. Let's pray. Lord, we bless you and we thank you for who you are. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for your word. And Lord, I pray that you would just make it evident to us our our unique gifting that's been given to us by the Holy Spirit and that we would come and be used. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this time, we're gonna go ahead and receive our offering as well as as our communication cards. Ushers, you can go ahead and do that at this time. If you're watching online with us today, thank you for joining us. Uh, You can give uh, by texting GIVE, I believe, to the number on the screen. If you believe Jesus for the first time today, let us know on the back of your communication card. We would love uh, to be able to send you some resources to help with that. Don't forget, for those of you who are here, we do still have hospitality. And I heard there's blueberry pie. Yes and amen. Coffee, tea, uh, blueberry pie, donuts, all those things. Come and join us in the tent out back. Let's go ahead and stand as we have our benediction. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, thank you for your church. Thank you for these people, Lord. Uh, Whether we've been here uh, a hundred times or this is our first time, Lord, I pray that you would just allow your spirit to minister through your word and to bless your people and and to lead them and guide them, convict them of sin and comfort them in their um, faint-heartedness, Lord. 
Uh, For every person under the sound of my voice, whether here or online, Lord, I pray that you would bless us and keep us, that you'd shine your face on us, and that you'd give us your peace, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, Amen. Amen. You may go in peace.